Question 32, Part 1 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Charity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues. The Virtue of Charity, by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 32 of Alms Deeds in Ten Articles, Part 1, Articles 1 through 5. We must now consider alms deeds, under which head there are ten points of inquiry. First, whether almsgiving is an act of charity second of the different kinds of alms third which alms are of greater account spiritual or corporal fourth whether corporal alms have a spiritual effect fifth whether the giving of alms is a matter of precept sixth whether corporal alms should be given out of the things we need seventh whether corporal alms should be given out of ill-gotten goods. Eighth, who can give alms? Ninth, to whom should we give alms? Tenth, how should alms be given? First article, whether almsgiving is an act of charity. Objection 1 it would seem that almsgiving is not an act of charity. For without charity, one cannot do acts of charity. Now it is possible to give alms without having charity, according to 1 Corinthians 13.3. If I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Therefore, almsgiving is not an act of charity. Objection to. Further, alms deeds are reckoned among works of satisfaction, according to Daniel 4.24. Redeem thou thy sins with alms. Now satisfaction is an act of justice. Therefore, almsgiving is an act of justice and not of charity. Objection 3. Further, the offering of sacrifices to God is an act of religion. But almsgiving is offering a sacrifice to God, according to Hebrews 13.16. Do not forget to do good and to impart, for by such sacrifices God's favor is obtained. Therefore, almsgiving is not an act of charity, but of religion. Objection 4. Further, the philosopher says in Ethics 4.1 that to give for a good purpose is an act of liberality. Now this is especially true of almsgiving. Therefore, almsgiving is not an act of charity. On the contrary, it is written in 2 John 3.17 He that hath the substance of this world and shall see his brother in need and shall put up his bowels from him, how doth the charity of God abide in him? I answer that external acts belong to that virtue which regards the motive for doing those acts. Now the motive for giving alms is to relieve one who is in need. Wherefore, some have defined alms as being a deed whereby something is given to the needy out of compassion and for God's sake, which motive belongs to mercy, as stated above in question 30, articles 1 and 2. Hence it is clear that almsgiving is, properly speaking, an act of mercy. This appears in its very name, for in Greek, eleemosine, it is derived from having mercy, elein even as the Latin miseratio is. And since mercy is an effect of charity, as shown above in question 30, article 2, 3, objection 3, 
it follows that almsgiving is an act of charity through the medium of mercy. Reply to Objection 1. An act of virtue may be taken in two ways. First, materially, thus an act of justice is to do what is just, and such an act of virtue can be without the virtue, since many, without having the habit of justice, do what is just, led by the natural light of reason, or through fear, or in the hope of gain. Secondly, we speak of a thing being an act of justice formally, and thus an act of justice is to do what is just, in the same way as a just man, that is, with readiness and delight, and such an act of virtue cannot be without the virtue. Accordingly, almsgiving can be materially without charity, but to give alms formally, that is, for God's sake, with delight and readiness, and altogether as one ought, is not possible without charity. Reply to Objection 2. Nothing hinders the proper elicited act of one virtue being commanded by another virtue as commanding it and directing it to this other virtue's end. It is in this way that almsgiving is reckoned among works of satisfaction, in so far as pity for the one in distress is directed to the satisfaction for his sin, and in so far as it is directed to placate God, it has the character of a sacrifice, and thus it is commanded by religion. Wherefore, the reply to the third objection is evident. Reply to Objection 4. Almsgiving belongs to liberality in so far as liberality removes an obstacle to that act, which might arise from excessive love of riches, the result of which is that one clings to them more than one ought. Second article. Whether the different kinds of alms deeds are suitably enumerated. Objection 1. It would seem that the different kinds of alms deeds are unsuitably enumerated. For we reckon seven corporal alms deeds, namely, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to harbor the harborless, to visit the sick, to ransom the captive, to bury the dead, all of which are expressed in the following verse, to visit, to quench, to feed, to ransom, clothe, harbor, or bury. Again we reckon seven spiritual alms, namely, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to reprove the sinner, to forgive injuries, to bear with those who trouble and annoy us, and to pray for all, which are all contained in the following verse, to counsel, reprove, console, to pardon, forbear, and to pray, and yet so that counsel includes both advice and instruction. And it seems that these various alms deeds are unsuitably enumerated, for the purpose of alms deeds is to succor our neighbor. But a dead man profits nothing by being buried, else our Lord would not have spoken truly when he said in Matthew 10:28. Be not afraid of them who kill the body, and after that have no more power that they can do. This explains why our Lord, in enumerating the works of mercy, made no mention of the burial of the dead, in Matthew 25, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, it seems that these alms deeds are unsuitably enumerated. Objection to, further, as stated above in Article 1, the purpose of giving alms is to relieve our neighbor's need. Now there are many needs of human life other than those mentioned above. For instance, a blind man needs a leader, a lame man needs someone to lean on, a poor man needs riches. Therefore, these alms deeds are unsuitably enumerated. Objection 3. Further, almsgiving is a work of mercy but the reproof of the wrongdoer savors, apparently, of severity rather than of mercy. Therefore, it ought not to be reckoned among the spiritual alms deeds. 
Objection for, further, almsgiving is intended for the supply of a defect. But no man is without the defect of ignorance in some matter or another. Therefore, apparently, each one ought to instruct anyone who is ignorant of what he knows himself. On the contrary, Gregory says, Let him that hath understanding beware, lest he withhold his knowledge. Let him that hath abundance of wealth watch, lest he slacken his merciful bounty. Let him who is a servant to art be most solicitous to share his skill and profit with his neighbor. Let him who has an opportunity of speaking with the wealthy fear lest he be condemned for retaining his talent, if when he has the chance he plead not with him the cause of the poor. Therefore, the aforesaid alms deeds are suitably enumerated in respect of those things whereof men have abundance or insufficiency. I answer that the aforesaid distinction of alms deeds is suitably taken from the various needs of our neighbor some of which affect the soul and are relieved by spiritual alms deeds while others affect the body and are relieved by corporal alms deeds for corporal need occurs either during this life or afterwards if it occurs during this life it is either a common need in respect of things needed by all or it is a special need occurring through some accident supervening in the first case the need is either internal or external. Internal need is twofold, one which is relieved by solid food, notably hunger, in respect of which we have to feed the hungry, while the other is relieved by liquid food, notably thirst, and in respect of this we have to give drink to the thirsty. The common need with regard to external help is twofold, one in respect of clothing, and as to this we have to clothe the naked, while the other is in respect of a dwelling place, and as to this we have to harbor the harborless. Again, if the need be special, it is either the result of an internal cause, like sickness, and then we have to visit the sick, or it results from an external cause, and then we have to ransom the captive. After this life, we give burial to the dead. In like manner, spiritual needs are relieved by spiritual acts in two ways. First, by asking for help from God, and in this respect we have prayer, whereby one man prays for others. Secondly, by giving human assistance, and this is in three ways. First, in order to relieve a deficiency on the part of the intellect, and if this deficiency be in the speculative intellect, the remedy is applied by instructing, and if in the practical intellect, the remedy is applied by counseling. Secondly, there may be a deficiency on the part of the appetitive power, especially by way of sorrow, which is remedied by comforting. Thirdly, the deficiency may be due to an inordinate act, and this may be the subject of a threefold consideration. First, in respect of the sinner, inasmuch as the sin proceeds from his inordinate will, and thus the remedy takes the form of reproof. Secondly, in respect of the person sinned against, and if the sin be committed against ourselves, we apply the remedy by pardoning the injury, while if it be committed against God or our neighbor, it is not in our power to pardon, as Jerome observes in his commentary on Matthew 18.15. Thirdly, in respect of the result of the inordinate act, on account of which the sinner is an annoyance to those who live with him, even beside his intention in which case the remedy is applied by bearing with him, especially with regard to those who sin out of weakness, according to Romans 15.1. We that are stronger ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. 
and not only as regards their being infirm and consequently troublesome on account of their unruly actions but also by bearing any other burdens of theirs with them according to galatians six two bear ye one another's burdens reply to objection one burial does not profit a dead man as though his body could be capable of perception after death in this sense our lord said that those who kill the body have no more that they can do and for this reason he did not mention the burial of the dead with the other works of mercy but those only which are more clearly necessary nevertheless it does concern the deceased what is done with his body both that he may live in the memory of man whose respect he forfeits if he remains without burial and as regards a man's fondness for his own body while he was yet living a fondness which kindly persons should imitate after his death it is thus that some are praised for burying the dead as tobias and those who buried our lord as augustine says reply to objection to all other needs are reduced to these for blindness and lameness are kinds of sickness so that to lead the blind and to support the lame come to the same as visiting the sick in like manner to assist a man against any distress that is due to an extrinsic cause comes to the same as the ransom of captives and the wealth with which we relieve the poor is sought merely for the purpose of relieving the aforesaid needs hence there is no reason for special mention of this particular need reply to objection three the reproof of the sinner as to the exercise of the act of reproving seems to imply the severity of justice but as to the intention of the reprover who wishes to free a man from the evil of sin it is an act of mercy and loving kindness according to proverbs twenty seven six better are the wounds of a friend than the deceitful kisses of an enemy reply to objection four nescience is not always a defect but only when it is about what one ought to know and it is a part of almsgiving to supply this defect by instruction in doing this however we should observe the due circumstances of persons place and time even as in other virtuous acts third article whether corporal alms are of more account than spiritual alms objection one it would seem that corporal alms are of more account than spiritual alms for it is more praiseworthy to give an alms to one who is in greater want since an alms deed is to be praised because it relieves one who is in need now the body which is relieved by corporal alms is by nature more needy than the spirit which is relieved by spiritual alms therefore corporal alms are of more account objection to further an alms is less praiseworthy and meritorious if the kindness is compensated wherefore our lord says in luke fourteen twelve when thou makest a dinner or a supper call not thy neighbours who are rich lest perhaps they also invite thee again now there is always compensation in spiritual alms deeds since he who prays for another profits thereby according to psalm thirty four thirteen my prayer shall be turned into my bosom and he who teaches another makes progress in knowledge which cannot be said of corporal alms deeds therefore corporal alms deeds are of more account than spiritual alms deeds objection three further an alms is to be commended if the needy one is comforted by it wherefore it is written in job thirty one twenty if his sides have not blessed me and the apostle says to philemon in verse seven the bowels of the saints have been refreshed by thee brother now a corporal alms is sometimes more welcome to a needy man than a spiritual alms therefore 
bodily almsdeeds are of more account than spiritual almsdeeds. On the contrary, Augustine says in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount 120, on the words, Give to him that asketh of thee, Matthew 5, 42, You should give so as to injure neither yourself nor another, and when you refuse what another asks, you must not lose sight of the claims of justice and send him away empty. At times, indeed, you will give what is better than what is asked for, if you reprove him that asks unjustly. Now reproof is a spiritual alms. Therefore, spiritual alms deeds are preferable to corporal alms deeds. I answer that, there are two ways of comparing these alms deeds. First, simply, and in this respect, spiritual alms deeds hold the first place for three reasons. First, because the offering is more excellent, since it is a spiritual gift, which surpasses a corporal gift, according to Proverbs 4.2, I will give you a good gift, forsake not my law. Secondly, on account of the object succored, because the spirit is more excellent than the body, wherefore, even as a man in looking after himself ought to look to his soul more than to his body, so ought he in looking after his neighbor, whom he ought to love as himself. Thirdly, as regards the acts themselves by which our neighbor is succored, because spiritual acts are more excellent than corporal acts which are, in fashion, servile. Secondly, we may compare them with regard to some particular case, when some corporal alms excels some spiritual alms. For instance, man in hunger is to be fed rather than instructed, and as the philosopher observes in Topics 3.2, for a needy man, money is better than philosophy, although the latter is better simply. Reply to Objection 1. It is better to give to one who is in greater want, other things being equal, but if he who is less needy is better and is in want of better things, it is better to give to him, and it is thus in the case in point. Reply to Objection 2. Compensation does not detract from merit and praise if it be not intended even as human glory, if not intended, does not detract from virtue. Thus Sallust says of Cato that the less he sought fame, the more he became famous. And thus it is with spiritual alms deeds. Nevertheless, the intention of gaining spiritual goods does not detract from merit as the intention of gaining corporal goods. Reply to Objection 3. The merit of an almsgiver depends on that in which the will of the recipient rests reasonably, and not on that in which it rests when it is inordinate. Fourth article. Whether corporal alms deeds have a spiritual effect. Objection 1. It would seem that corporal alms deeds have not a spiritual effect for no effect exceeds its cause. But spiritual goods exceed corporal goods. Therefore, corporal alms deeds have no spiritual effect. Objection to, further, the sin of simony consists in giving the corporal for the spiritual, and it is to be utterly avoided. Therefore, one ought not to give alms in order to receive a spiritual effect. Objection 3. Further, to multiply the cause is to multiply the effect. If, therefore, corporal alms deeds cause a spiritual effect, the greater the alms, the greater the spiritual profit, which is contrary to what we read in Luke 21.3 of the widow who cast two brass mites into the treasury and in our Lord's own words, cast in more than all. Therefore, bodily alms deeds have no spiritual effect. 
On the contrary, it is written in Ecclesiasticus 17.18, The alms of a man shall preserve the grace of a man as the apple of the eye. I answer that, corporal alms deeds may be considered in three ways. First, with regard to their substance, and in this way they have merely a corporal effect, inasmuch as they supply our neighbor's corporal needs. Secondly, they may be considered with regard to their cause, in so far as a man gives a corporal alms out of love for God and his neighbor, and in this respect they bring forth a spiritual fruit, according to Ecclesiasticus 29, verses 13 and 14. Lose thy money for thy brother, place thy treasure in the commandments of the Most High, and it shall bring thee more profit than gold. Thirdly, with regard to the effect, and in this way again they have a spiritual fruit, inasmuch as our neighbor, who is succored by a corporal alms, is moved to pray for his benefactor. Wherefore, the above text goes on, in Ecclesiasticus 29, verse 15, Shut up alms in the heart of the poor, and it shall obtain help for thee from all evil. Reply to Objection 1. This argument considers corporal alms deeds as to their substance. Reply to Objection 2. He who gives an alms does not intend to buy a spiritual thing with a corporal thing, for he knows that spiritual things infinitely surpass corporal things, but he intends to merit a spiritual fruit through the love of charity. Reply to Objection 3. The widow, who gave less in quantity, gave more in proportion, and thus we gather that the fervor of her charity, whence corporal alms deeds derive their spiritual efficacy, was greater. Fifth Article whether almsgiving is a matter of precept. Objection 1. It would seem that almsgiving is not a matter of precept. For the counsels are distinct from the precepts. Now almsgiving is a matter of counsel, according to Daniel 4.24. Let my counsel be acceptable to the king. Redeem thou thy sins with alms. Therefore, Almsgiving is not a matter of precept. Objection to, further, it is lawful for everyone to use and to keep what is his own. Yet by keeping it, he will not give alms. Therefore, it is lawful not to give alms, and consequently, almsgiving is not a matter of precept. Objection 3. Further, Whatever is a matter of precept binds the transgressor at some time or another under pain of mortal sin, because positive precepts are binding for some fixed time. Therefore, if almsgiving were a matter of precept, it would be possible to point to some fixed time when a man would commit a mortal sin unless he gave an alms. But it does not appear how this can be so because it can always be deemed probable that the person in need can be relieved in some other way, and that what we would spend in almsgiving might be needful to ourselves either now or in some future time. Therefore, it seems that almsgiving is not a matter of precept. Objection 4. Further, every commandment is reducible to the precepts of the Decalogue, but these precepts contain no reference to almsgiving. Therefore, almsgiving is not a matter of precept. On the contrary, no man is punished eternally for omitting to do what is not a matter of precept. But some are punished eternally for omitting to give alms, as is clear from Matthew 25, verses 41 to 43. Therefore, Almsgiving is a matter of precept. I answer that, as love of our neighbor is a matter of precept, 
whatever is a necessary condition to the love of our neighbor is a matter of precept also. Now the love of our neighbor requires that not only should we be our neighbor's well-wishers, but also his well-doers, according to 1 John 3.18. Let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And in order to be a person's well-wisher and well-doer, we ought to succor his needs, and this is done by almsgiving. Therefore, almsgiving is a matter of precept. Since, however, precepts are about acts of virtue, it follows that all almsgiving must be a matter of precept in so far as it is necessary to virtue, namely, in so far as it is demanded by right reason. Now right reason demands that we should take into consideration something on the part of the giver and something on the part of the recipient. On the part of the giver, it must be noted that he should give of his surplus, according to Luke 11.41. That which remaineth, give alms. The surplus is to be taken in reference not only to himself, so as to denote what is unnecessary to the individual, but also in reference to those of whom he has charge, in which case we have the expression necessary to the person. Because each one must first of all look after himself and then after those over whom he has charge, and afterwards, with what remains, relieve the needs of the others. Thus, nature first, by its nutritive power, takes what it requires for the upkeep of one's own body, and afterwards yields the residue for the formation of another by the power of generation. On the part of the recipient, it is requisite that he should be in need, else there would be no reason for giving him alms. Yet since it is not possible for one individual to relieve the needs of all, we are not bound to relieve all who are in need, but only those who could not be succored if we did not succor them. For in such cases the words of Ambrose apply, Feed him that dies of hunger, if thou hast not fed him, thou hast slain him. Accordingly, we are bound to give alms of our surplus, as also to give alms to one whose need is extreme. Otherwise almsgiving, like any other greater good, is a matter of counsel. Reply to Objection 1. Daniel spoke to a king who is not subject to God's law, wherefore such things as were prescribed by the law, which he did not profess, had to be counseled to him. Or he may have been speaking in reference to a case in which almsgiving was not a matter of precept. Reply to Objection 2. The temporal goods which God grants us are ours as to the ownership but as to the use of them, they belong not to us alone, but also to such others as we are able to succor out of what we have over and above our needs. Hence Basil says, in his homily on Luke 12.18, If you acknowledge them, notably your temporal goods, as coming from God, is he unjust because he apportions them unequally? Why are you rich? while another is poor, unless it be that you may have the merit of a good stewardship, and he the reward of patience. It is the hungry man's bread that you withhold, the naked man's cloak that you have stored away, the shoe of the barefoot that you have left to rot, the money of the needy that you have buried underground, and so you injure as many as you might help. Ambrose expresses himself in the same way. Reply to Objection 3. There is a time when we sin mortally if we omit to give alms. On the part of the recipient, when we see that his need is evident and urgent, and that he is not likely to be succored otherwise. On the part of the giver, when he has superfluous goods which he does not need for the time being, as far as he can judge with probability nor need he consider every case that may possibly occur in the future, 
for this would be to think about the moral, which our Lord forbade us to do in Matthew 6.34, but he should judge what is superfluous and what is necessary, according as things probably and generally occur. Reply to Objection 4. All succor given to our neighbor is reduced to the precept about honoring our parents. For thus does the Apostle interpret it in 1 Timothy 4.8, where he says, Dutifulness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. And he says this because the precept about honoring our parents contains the promise that thou mayest be long-lived upon the land. Exodus 20, 12. And dutifulness comprises all kinds of almsgiving. End of question 32, part 1. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C.